I like going hunting Just me, my hound, and my gun Chasing them deer, rabbit, and squirrel Now that's my kind of fun I like going fishing too I'll go on any whim Looking for the big bass The poppy and the brim Just give me a wide open field To walk through Give me an ocean so deep I want to ride the longest river in the world Or maybe climb the highest mountain peak Like going down to the fishing hole My buddies and me, I'm old cane pole Bake them hooks and wet them lines This life I love so fine It's almost supper time You'd think the world was mine And now for today's outdoor adventure, here's Archie Phillips. Well, folks, got a real, real interesting show for you today. Got my good buddy Ray Scott here, old schoolmate from down here at Auburn, Alabama. And Ray is head of the Bass Anglers Society of America. And you say, well, what in the world is he doing down here with monkeying around with all these deers? Now, Ray, you've got a story to tell us, haven't you? Well, I do have a story to tell. Archie, I've always, of course, been known as a bass fisherman and have been since I was a kid, but I've also had another interest, and that is these critters right here called a white-tailed deer. I've always been infatuated with them and curious about them, and I started the bass, uh, bass organization 25 years ago, but I started with the Whitetail Institute about three years ago, and, of course, the purpose of, is to come up with a host of uh, curiosities to be satisfied that hunters like you and I have and have never really had the answers. Uh, things we're doing at the Institute, of course, are, are numerous. Uh, we're doing genetic studies. We're finding out what deer like to eat. Uh, we know what they need to eat and how to make trophy animals. And the animals we're having here that you're looking at are animals, uh, part of a study that we brought in deer from up north, uh, we're up in Montana and Alberta, Canada. And we have these deer separated from a group of Alabama deers, which we'll probably see in a few minutes. But we want to know if they will grow the same, if they're fed the same over a period of years. It's like taking a pair of twins and separating them and seeing if, if exactly. it's genetic or heredity. That's right, right exactly. I mean, or if it's a environment. That's right. The thing we've learned, and I think the thing that came out of our earliest studies, was that we know there are three things that will make a, a quality animal. That's the genetics, and that's whatever your mother and daddy and grandmother put in your system when you were born. Second is how long you live. And that's the case of a deer, of course. And the third and most important thing is what the deer eats. And that, it impacts everything from the pregnant doe to the fawn, right on up through the situ situation you have right here. These animals are all barely making two years old. Ooh, boy, there's and, some uh, fine racks on them well, deer. Every one of them was, now these are northern deers or, white, or southern deer? This particular deer. group are northern deer, but we have, we have an inseparate containment area. We have about 10 acres here, uh, deer that are, are a representative of the Alabama area, and they're handsome deer as well. We don't really know what's going to happen in what, as far as body size and antler development until perhaps four or five years out. Right now, the northern deer are slightly ahead, but the curious part about it is that we have found out that deer fed properly will manifest a great rack much quicker than one that's not, and that's the great discovery that we've made at the Whitetail Institute. All right, well, let's see what, well, how you've got this thing rigged up, and we'll go up here and check on some of this feed. All right, it's a deal. Now, Ray, you know, we, we talk uh, about all this nutrition stuff on these deer. We talked about genetics. If they ain't got it from mom and pop, it ain't going to happen. That's right. All right. Then you've got uh, your genetics, then you've got your nutrition. That's the most important thing. Your nutrition. But one more ingredient, Archie, remember to have quality animals, and that is that thing right there. The trigger finger. Trigger finger. You've got to let a deer get some age. You can't shoot uh, every deer you see and expect to have trophy deer. People complain in Alabama, for example, of why we don't have better deer. And the average deer buck that's killed is a year and a half old. In other words, that's like a reason we don't catch as many 10-pound bass in Alabama is because we caught them when they was a weight a pound, right? That's exactly right. That's one of the reasons. You have to obviously control populations. We mustn't forget that. We need to remove, renew, remove the total number of the population so that what's left can live, number one, and number two, have enough to eat. But we've learned beyond any doubt that supplemental feeding for white-tailed deer is an absolute must if you want quality animals. You cannot do it otherwise. And um, Imperial white-tailed clover, which was developed through the efforts of the Institute, has proven to be that, that missing link. 
Well, 12 well, months a year. What, what they got, we got natural clover. It blooms all over Alabama like a white dutch. It's in the little kind of damp places and pastures. And then, you, of course, people plant the, the crimson clover. I used to keep bees, and I'd love to put mine on that crimson clover. But what, what makes this any different from, from that or the cereal or grains like the rye and the wheat and all that stuff that people well, plant? Well, most, most people, of course, uh, Alabamians that, that plant for wildlife, they plant it, first of all, to attract deer. And they can do it with any of the things you mentioned, wheat, rye, and I planted the 10 carloads of it over the years. Until I found out that they prefer a type of clover, if you could get that, uh, 10 clovers may have 10 different tastes. Uh, white Dutch, for example, and a host of clovers that we see on the highways of Alabama last a few months and they're dead. And right. we go to, go to seed. And the deer in the meantime doesn't have anything to eat, even on the highways. But what we want to do is produce a 12 month producing clover that would even go beyond that. And that's what we've done here. This is past the taste test of deer, beyond any doubt. Uh, we know that it's full of nutrition, the stuff that makes antlers grow like the ones you've just seen here. And most important of all, the deer like it. And when you can couple all those elements together and want to go out and take a tractor and scratch a place or two on your hunting grounds and have a deer coming from your neighbors and everywhere else that you can look at and either, either harvest them or not harvest them, at least have a choice, this will do it because it will pull them. We've tested over and over and over. And as a matter of fact, last year more than a million pounds were planted by serious deer hunters across the nation. You know, it's growing good right down here at Penatella, Alabama, but how do you know a stuff will grow all over the country? We plant it all over the country. We have a field tester program that, uh, that anybody can get into that's serious about their hunting. And they have been our eyes and ears across the nation, plus the universities. And we know, for example, as far north as Canada, this product will produce, and it produces very well as low as, low as Florida. The only thing we want to caution people about is you plant it properly. You don't plant it by some haphazard throwing it out the back of a pickup truck or something. You have to make a little effort. But that investment in time and energy on the front end will give you up to four years, we know because we've got it, four years of this kind of performance. Okay. It, it produces in dry weather and in cold. We had weather well below zero right here where we're sitting this past December. There was not even a skip of the heartbeat and it produces through the drought. The land you're looking at right now, it parched. In Alabama, we've had about eight weeks almost with a quarter of an inch of rain, and it, the ground is parched. Someone called it cactus clover. You can't hardly cool. run that deer off that clover there, can you, Ray? No, he's pretty I noticed they come out of that. That's just regular old, uh, I guess you call that range grass behind you there, isn't it? Just what would normally is, grow? Yeah, just regular old common field grass. and, and uh, Well, they don't like it, do they? Look how high it's done got. Well, you know, we have a contrast. We have as many as 12, 15 different plants in these areas, and we observe the deer to determine what they really like. And, of course, they, you can see where they're spending most of the time eating. Yeah. Now, this deer, by the way, all these deer are, are just barely reaching two years old. And Boy, uh, he, he's got he's, he got, uh, he got a good set of horns. We've on. got uh, nine and ten points. Anybody be and, proud of that set right there? Look at them. Look at them nice horns. Well, you want to remember something else, Archie, that this deer is in velvet, and, of course, and the velvet will be leaving probably in September, but we'll have some antler development uh, right on into the time it starts hardening up and uh, and uh, ready to shed the velvet. And, and, and people don't know, but deer, of course, lose their antlers every year and grow them back. It's a fast. Show them where they come off, right? Well, he ain't gonna cooperate. Right there at the base of the skull, there, they just fall off every year, and then they come back. So now, Ray, it's possible that if that deer right there was took off of this clover and put in a place that was really over browsed, next year them horns could come back littler. Absolutely, that's absolutely a positive. If you take a deer off good nutrition and put him on, 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 on poor nutrition, that antler, that antler will fail to produce its possible potential. Ray, who's credited with developing imperial clover? Well, we, I wish I could say we did, but the, the Whitetail Institute was principally responsible, but we had a lot of help from universities in Auburn, for example, and Mississippi State who developed part of the, uh, the, the uh, ingredients that go into our blend. But I guess I have to say that the one man who has done more for us is Auburn University, Dr. Wiley Johnson, who was the inventor of one of the premier clovers that are in our formulation. He invented it several years ago, as a matter of fact. But it's, it's a host of people, and I got to credit field testers, people who have hunted hunters who have bought the clover and planted with our instructions and our help. As a matter of fact, we produce a, a video now for our field testers and people who, who buy our clover. It tells them everything the world they want to know. Well, you. 
you can't just go out there and throw this stuff on the ground about a week before deer season and expect it to be create a miracle. Now, and that's the fact of the matter. No, right? you can't. But by the same token, it's not complicated. It's like it's like following the bouncing ball. Is the, the tape, for example, is is simple. A thirteen year old boy uh, with a bar. But you need it. to do it right. Has to be done right. Uh, if, you, if you want the top results. That's right. This clover will last. It, it is. I would. I have to argue that it. From my own stupidity of the past, planting wheat, oats, and ryegrass, and most of the other stuff, it lasts a little while and dies. This lasts and lasts and makes this far more economical, plus pulling the deer, plus feeding and creating those antlers and body weights that we want. Now, Ray, you, you planted all kind of stuff, and tell me about this one. Archie, I had the, the, the misfortune of planting everything in the world, and I thought I was saving money, I guess, planting wheat and oats and some of the stuff, but when the hunting season was over, I'd packed up and fold up my little uh, tree stand and, and hit the home. We wouldn't go back till the next fall. Only to find out what was there was history. And the poor deer had nothing good to eat all those months from the time hunting season ended until I went back and planted. This is the most cost efficient seed you can put on the ground because not only does it last three or four months during hunting season and die or turn to seed, it lasts on through that critical springtime and in the uh, early summertime when that deer needs to build that, that protein up to push those antlers and in the case of those have uh, healthy fawns. What I notice here, you got jump start. Now what do you mean by jump start? Well, jump start is a, is a new innovation. It was, again, Dr. Uh, Wiley Johnson from Auburn helped develop. And it is a change in the formulation that gives the, the planting in the field a much quicker growth in the fall year. A lot of fellows were a little discouraged because it didn't grow fast, as, as wheat, for example, be up three inches high, and this was a half inch. So what this gives, hello, how are you? My friend came up and said hello. He <laughs> loves this stuff. <laughs> Watch it, dear. Uh, get on, man. Get on. Uh, but you see, he's saying that I can, in his own way, open it up and let's plant some more. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's a Bojangle right there. That's Bojangle, huh? But uh, anyway, this is very simply a jump start. It gives it a quick burst of growth right after you plant it. And that's get that one type of clover, is that right? One of the ingredients, that's okay. correct. But when you look across the field, you'll see a field full of foliage, whereas before you saw just a green, just a little smaller plant. I see. Two to three times faster growth, and of course it already has that long-lasting capacity to go not only through the year, but on into the additional years with very little maintenance. So let, let me make sure I got this straight now. If we planted regular old clover or oats or any such stuff, you're going to have a good bit of cost in, in, in doing your soil, getting it ready. That's some cost you got to figure. Preparation is the same whatever you plant. That's right. Regard. All right, we got that cost. We plant it. It's only good for three to four uh, months, and it ain't good in the time the deer need it the most, That's from right. January into March. That's exactly right. And then this goes right on through there, and then it just keeps on going. It's in its glory in the spring. Now this time of the year, of course, it's a little bit stressed, but that's going to be like you and I standing out here. Yeah. But it will continue to produce, and the first time you have a cool night in the fall, it's just boom. And of course, the deer keep it mowed down, and, and all wildlife. I might have wild turkey are crazy about it. And I know turkey year, like clover. Oh, man, and, and the young turkey going in chasing bugs. But it's What just about a, for cattle grazing? Is it wrong stuff for cows? You can do it. I don't, I'm not expert on cattle, and I, I wouldn't want to recommend it, but I do know this for deer. Deer eat it, and it, and it does beautifully. Uh, we've increased, I want to mention something to you. A lot of folks know here at the Institute, we've monitored with the cooperation of the state on our DMP program, which is a deer management program, the, the weights and, and so forth about a year and a half bucks and that we've harvested for the last four years. And actually, we've had, a, I think it's 150 percent, no, I'll take it back, yeah, 150 percent increase in antler mass and points. Well, in now, four now, years, now, now you're, year. you're talking about just the wild deer that's outside of these pen all over your I'm place talking out about there. Everywhere. Oh, we've got 800 acres over in Lowndes County, for example, that we harvest mm -hmm. deer under the state's guidance and supervision. And we have seen the weights of these animals go up about 25 pounds per average year and a half deer just in four years. In other words, the same deer. Plus, the antlers have grown from little spikes to averaging five points. The same on, on the second year. Well, Every year, every year we take a year and a half bucks off here, and those average, the year and a half bucks are, are changing from, in four years, from one pointers to five pointers. Five pointers, good. A year and a half deer, you see. I see. And the body weight's increasing. So the only thing we've done is, is that we can recognize for sure is that we have keep, kept our food plots planted in Imperial White Tail Clover, and that's the only thing we can say, we can, we can know for certain that we've changed. And uh, I think the, the state's doing a great job on the DMP program, and of course we're, we're happy to have the opportunity to, to, to monitor and track what's Your happening. Deer. Our deer. And, it, and wild and as ones in captivity. 
I know these deer love it. Now, Ray, I see up there by your institute building, you got a tower up there. Now, what's that for? The, right. them, these, are, these deer are in a, in a fence here, they can't get out. What do you need a tower for? Well, Archie, that is a, that's an observation tower, and in the fall of the year, when we would normally plant uh, for, for, for deer, we'll put about 12 to 14 different strips, about 20 feet wide, running down toward us right here, in different kinds of food for deer. All kinds of clovers, wheat, oats, and a host of other exotic uh, plantings. And what we do, we open this gate, and allow these, these deer to come in here. From these other places. That's right. And then we have a man set up there all day. We have two shifts. He says one stays up half day, the other stays the other half. And every 15 minutes, he records how many deer are on each of those individual strips. So if we do this all week, we can make a determination of where they're grazing. And based on that, we know the taste. And that's one of many ways we have, besides, our, of course, our, our field test program, but we have hunters telling us what they like to eat with well, some of the tests. Well, in other words, if you, it's just like running an ice cream parlor here. You got some chocolate here, and some strawberry, and some vanilla, and at the end of the week, right. you add up the numbers, that it number. tells you they've been eating it, they've got the choice of anything they want, so at the end of the week, you know exactly which one of them, what was the results, right? right. Well, the results were obvious, but uh, the thing is, we didn't know that for sure. We constantly upgrade. We're having studies done right now to uh, Auburn's uh, Dr. Wiley Johnson and others across the country have even field testers are te testing experimental clovers in different parts of the country for us. To see if they do the same thing? In their area. And we take all that pumping into the computer and at the end of the year we know exactly where we're headed for the next 12 months. Great. Archie, right, this is the oldest single field we've got. This was planted nearly four years ago and it is, uh, as you know, the high spot on our whole property. We're just about a mile and a half on our, from our research facility. And this is where all your wild deer is running loose. Wild as, as, as they can be. And of course, we can monitor here in the, in the fall of the year, in the early spring, how the deer come in on this particular plant in pure white tail clover. But right now, we're in a dreadful drought, and this is one of the real supreme tests of our product. Because this clover, it proves once again that this field without water, eight weeks and we've had a quarter of an inch of rain and the ground's cracking, there's no moisture, everything it did, but the clover field is still here and the deer are still grazing. Look at Ray. Look, look at this crack. Here's a crack right here. I wanted to show them that. That uh, thing goes on down there, it looks like a foot and a half, right? Well, it's, uh, you can run your arm down there and lose, you can lose a small kid in this hole. But uh, to give you an idea how, look at this, I just stuck this down there to show you how wide it is. This is a copy of our how-to videotape, by the way, that everybody who, who buys the product and plants it properly and get one of these. Uh, Got all free. the bugs worked at it. Hey, if you can watch and listen, you can know how to plant for food plots. I don't think I ought to even plant it with a I've looked at that thing, it's an excellent job. I don't think a man ought to plant your clover till he's read, till he's looked at it. Well, you really shouldn't. Uh, you I know, mean, it's just got so many good points in it there, right? It's so, so many little things you can do wrong. I mean, the right time of the year is where most folks mess up or perhaps covering it too much. But this tells you exactly without uh, any, any, it's a 13 year old level. Uh, teaching. Can pick up and go. Pick up and take off, and he's a farmer. There and you he's go. got a field of clover. Now, Ray, is this is this this famous President George Bush fishing lake that he liked to come to? Uh, this is it, Archie, and uh, right here in this very water, 55 acres of it, is where he and Mrs. Bush came uh, the last two years to, to spend New Year's and Christmas time with me. Well, they don't, they don't always come at the best fishing time, though, do they? No, they come the worst time, and I guess that's the supreme test of their fishing skills and, uh, and, and my prayer meeting, because they came, <laughs> they came here, and I tell you, it was ice on this lake uh, this past uh, January the 1st, two days before they got here. <laughs> Thawed out, we caught 60 bass in, uh, in just uh, a little over six hours of fishing. Well, I knew when they said he was coming, I said, boy, Ray sure didn't invite him at no good time. <laughs> well, it's kind of hard to get him to do it like I want to do it. Aren't yeah, you? I know. Well, now, didn't y'all have a tournament out here and raise a thousand, uh, ten, hundred thousand dollars, wasn't it? Raised a hundred thousand dollars. The Bass Pros got together and decided to build a sanctuary. It's Pent Lala Baptist Church and we had a ten thousand dollar per boat entry fee. Put ten boats on here and fished for about five hours. And the largest bass that's ever been caught in the fishing tournament was caught right here in this lake. Weighed 14 pounds, shy of one ounce. Goodness gracious. Ray, it's been many years since we was at our old alma mater down to Auburn together. And you like bass fishing, and you went on your way with the bass and the Bass Anglers Sportsman Society. And I liked them too, so we, we all started mounting them. So <laughs> you was catching and we was mounting them. That's a pretty good combination. But you've got another interest, and I really see your hearts in it. It's a beautiful place you got here. And you're doing a lot of good primary research on these deers right here, and I'm, I'm glad somebody's doing it because there's been a lot of 
of misinformation about deers and everybody wants to harvest a nice buck or just feed them or watch them and I believe you got a winning combination here now. We think so, Archie. Uh, we appreciate all the hunters across the country that have been our field testers and those that will join us as field testers now and re report to us their findings and their the best knowledge is in the hands of the, of the serious hunter, Archie. And, and y'all gonna y'all gonna keep it on computer here and keep pouring this information in there and, and trying to let this information back out through the your institute, right? That's right? exactly right. And, and and those hunters that are seriously interested in improving the quality of the deer on their hunting area. And don't mind sucking deer off of the neighbor. He can plant this field of clover right here on their own property and see what happens. It's absolutely incredible. Well, we hope you all have enjoyed this. I know I have as far as uh, I thought I knew a little bit about deer nutrition until I got down here. But something that will keep them on there. After we walk out of the woods, when hunting season's over, they still got to eat, hadn't they, Ray? That's right. And then with, with your clover there, that it just stays with them for a couple of three years anyway. Actually, it's a fact. And I, I do hope that those who are serious deer hunters will take the time to, to call us at our headquarters on our toll-free number and get the full story on Imperial Whitetail Clover and what they can do, perhaps as field testers, in planting this fine product. Well, that's great. Well, uh, Ray had been, just had a great time oh, down here. Super, with you. I, understand why, I understand why now the president likes to come down to your place. He can see the deers and fool with them or catch some 14-pound bass out of your <laughs> lake. It, it's just been a great day. And y'all folks stay tuned again next week for some more outdoors with Archie Phillips.